in 1910, a young American pilot named Eugene Eli started his small biplane down a ramp built on the deck of a U.S. Navy cruiser. As he reached the end of this flight deck, horrified spectators watched his plane dip from sight. His wheels and propeller skimmed the water, but the plane managed to climb and landed safely on shore two miles from the ship. Two months later, Eli reversed the stunt. He took off from an airfield and landed on the cruiser. Eugene Eli had demonstrated what military minds had only dreamed of, the melding of naval and air power into one super weapon, the aircraft carrier. On August 2nd, 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the carrier USS Independence and her battle group were performing standard fleet exercises in the Indian Ocean. Within hours, they had moved into the Gulf and were ready to support some battle group represented the only US offensive strike power in the region. When we have national crises, like the um, crisis in Iraq, it's, you saw the problem of getting forces there. I mean, ground troops, you've got to fly in, you've got to have supplies in a matter of hours uh, from, the, from the Mediterranean within 48 hours. They're on the scene capable of laying down three squadrons of attack aircraft, two squadrons of fighter aircraft, day and night off of each aircraft carrier. You have what you need, almost no matter what you need, uh, at almost any point in the, in the globe. Uh, Desert Storm showed that the Navy could operate at the same sortie rates as the Air Force. Um, plane type by plane type. By the time Operation Desert Storm began on January 17, 1991, the U.S. Navy had deployed six aircraft carrier groups to the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, capable of launching over 300 of the world's most advanced strike and interceptor aircraft. F.A. 18 and A-7 flew thousands of strikes against targets in Iraq and Kuwait and dropped over 11,000 tons of ordnance. No impact yet. Thank you. But there's two. Boom, boom. Secondary, big time. These aircraft carried out attack reconnaissance brethren. They were perfectly capable of operating from land or from sea. We're talking about air complement is the equivalent to most of the nations in the world's air forces. Our missions tend to be very long, four and a half to five hours. Brief normally takes place about an hour prior to your launch time. Once we take off, we uh, end up going feet dry, proceeding about 380 miles over a uh, desert where you have no reference, no towns, no tack hands. So you're basically trusting the systems in your airplane, your own gut feeling. The F-18 uh, provides us a unique opportunity to fill uh, several roles. Uh, we are primarily carrying uh, ordnance across uh, into Iraq to uh, military targets. The bomb damage assessment that we've brought back from, uh, from our strikes uh, indicate that the airplane is truly accurate from virtually any altitude. Its agility and its computer systems just make it uh, a dream in combat. The multi-billion dollar aircraft carrier accomplished its mission in the Gulf with remarkable precision. The carrier's role is a highly mobile, self-reliant, and heavily armed military force made its presence invaluable. It's a very, very effective weapon, a mobile airfield that can go anywhere in the world. And there's basically very few strategic targets that an aircraft carrier cannot hit with its conventional or nuclear uh, capability. None. It could have been one, I don't believe, without the, the aid of the aircraft carriers. The evolution of these technological marvels began 90 years earlier when the dream of flight became a reality. The Wright brothers' first powered flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903 had scarcely touched down when some military experts began to view the airplane as a war machine. Not only could it serve as a land-based weapon, they reasoned, it could also operate from a ship at sea. But naval officials had their doubts. In September of 1910, the U.S. Navy gave the okay to launch and bird both by curiosity and the fear 
that a German steamship line was about to attempt the same experiment. The ship was easy to find, but the pilot was not. Wilbur Wright rejected the Navy's offer, but fortunately, a visionary American aviator named Glenn Curtis and a stunt pilot named Eugene Eli were eager to assist. In November of 1910, Eugene Eli raced his Curtis Pusher Model D biplane off the forecastle of the USS Birmingham. The flight was a success. Several months later, they were ready to attempt a landing on a cruiser. A hook was mounted underneath the plane to engage wires weighted only with sandbags. This primitive arrestor system proved successful. With the success of these experiments, the Navy was now guardedly optimistic about the future of naval aviation. I got the idea that would amount to something for naval purposes. So I put in a request to the Navy Department, and they came back and quite frankly said that they didn't believe aviation would ever amount to anything. But if it turned out to be otherwise, uh, they would consider my request. During that winter, Congress appropriated money for the Navy to buy three airplanes. In 1914, the U.S. Navy founded the Naval Aviation Flight Academy at Pensacola, Florida. Almost immediately, young men volunteered to become pioneers of naval aviation. During this period, Britain ruled the seas. Always open to new ideas, the British also began developing naval aviation. It was really the First World War which spurred the Royal Navy into putting aircraft to sea. The major reason for putting aircraft on ships was to extend the eyes of the Admiral so he could see over the horizon and spot for enemy battle fleets. So in the early days of the First War, the Royal Navy took over a number of cross-channel steamers, converted them to carry seaplanes. This early adaptation of a modern aircraft carrier took modified planes that would land in the water alongside a fighting ship and were then hoisted on board. The United States also used seaplanes in World War I. Both nations saw sea boats, but it was soon found that seaplanes had limited capabilities. They could only be launched and recovered in calm weather. When storms prevailed, seaplanes were rendered useless. Soon, Britain and the United States developed catapults, which more easily launched aircraft from ships. With these innovations, both countries were now ready to create ships devoted solely to launching and landing aircraft. The um, first aircraft carriers uh, in the more traditional sense were not special built. They were converted from other vessels, armored cruisers or something, and they featured relatively short decks and primitive landing systems. The British converted an Italian passenger liner into a carrier and named it the HMS Argus in September of 1918. It was truly a flat top with no masts, no stacks, and no superstructure, flush with the main deck, providing a smooth runway. The Americans were soon to follow with the USS Langley, a converted coal ship. The Langley's flight deck measured 542 feet in length, and the carrier could hold 30 flight-ready aircraft and an elevator was installed to transport the planes back and forth from the flight deck to the hangar below. The Navy quickly began testing their new invention. Early attempts at landing were highly dangerous. The light aircraft were likely to be caught by gusts of wind and either crash on the deck or swerve over the side. Both the British and Americans experimented with systems of longitudinal wires along the length of the flight deck to steady the aircraft until it slowed down. This system was not effective. So engineers devised an improved horizontal wire system with wires connected to weights under the deck. With these early technical innovations, the aircraft carrier became a viable weapon of war. moment here on A&E. In order to limit the large numbers of warships in the post-war era, 
naval leaders from around the world gathered to draft the Washington Naval Disarmament Treaty of 1921. The treaty provided the first formal definition of an aircraft carrier. A warship with a water displacement in excess of 10,000 tons, but not more than 27,000 tons. Designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying, launching, and landing aircraft. Under the new treaty was from existing battle cruiser hulls. The converted carriers Lexington and Saratoga had flight decks that were substantially longer than the Langley, and they could carry twice as many planes. The Navy chose an open hangar design, which allowed the maximum number of aircraft to be carried and provided for better ventilation of gasoline fumes while aircraft engines were being warmed up. The Japanese were quick to complete the world's first true aircraft carrier, the Hosho. It was a small ship capable of carrying only 26 aircraft. The States commissioned its first true carrier, the USS Ranger. This ship was substantially smaller than its predecessors, but could hold almost the same amount of aircraft. These carriers incorporated the first hydraulic arrestor gear system. If a plane began to swerve to one side, a compensating mechanism would increase pressure and tug the plane to the center of the deck. This system, modified and improved, is still in use today. I first qualified in a fighter back in February 36. I found it quite exciting because it looked like a fairly small about flying an airplane in cooperation with somebody else, and that somebody else would be the landing signals officer. Before we were qualified, at least before we were registered as qualified, we obviously were qualified by the time we'd done the second one. The Yorktown, Enterprise, Hornet, and Wasp followed. These carriers were faster, larger, and more heavily armored than their predecessors. That had to be to carry the more advanced aircraft that were quickly being developed. The requirements for carrier aircraft were very different than land video engines as a rule because those were easier to maintain and service on a carrier. And more than anything else, the pilots had to be highly trained because they had to find a moving target out at sea. Between the wars, Britain, Japan, and the U.S. perfected almost every technique needed for successfully launching and operating aircraft from a carrier. But the carrier was still considered mainly a scout for the battle fleets. Its potential as an attack vehicle had not yet. Carrier was really nothing much more for the airplanes. It had no other function except to carry airplanes. But by the time the war started, the realization had developed that the carrier was an attack weapon and not a scouting weapon. It would be the Japanese who would be the first to establish the aircraft carrier in a powerful new role. December 7th, 1941, the Japanese aircraft from six aircraft carriers more than 300 miles off the coast of Hawaii. In two separate strikes, superbly trained air crews severely crippled or destroyed all but one of the mighty American battleships. Hundreds of American planes in the ground were lost. The Army and Navy suffered more than 4,500 casualties. The Japanese carriers had inflicted a defeat upon the United States at Pearl Harbor, but they didn't get the American carriers that were... The attack had not been the decisive victory the Japanese had planned. Japanese intelligence had failed to locate the carriers of the Pacific Fleet normally based at Pearl. The Japanese had made the carrier the most important ship in their navy, and now the Americans would be forced to make it the centerpiece of their fleet as well. The Pacific War had become the Carrier War. Within hours, the United States was an active participant in World War II. We will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. But in the early stages of the Pacific War, the Japanese enjoyed most of the victories. American forces desperately needed a boost in morale. In April of 1942, 16 Army B-25 bound for Tokyo. 
the Americans were hoping to divert some of the Japanese military force away from their South Sea objective, as well as prove they were capable of striking the Japanese homeland. The raid, led by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, began when the carrier was still hundreds of miles away from the target. Doolittle's own plane led the assault. It took a full hour to lift all the heavy bombers from the carrier deck. was a public relations success for the U.S. government because it proved to the American people that the Japanese Empire was not invincible. The first great carrier versus carrier battle occurred in the Coral Sea. For the first time in naval history, the opposing ships never came in sight of each other. The aircraft were taking the battle away from the direct conflict between one warship and another, the sort of engagements between battleships that were seen in the First World War and they were fighting the, the war at a distance. The Battle of Midway was fought the following month. To the great advantage of the United States, intelligence was able to decode the Japanese attack plans. On the morning of the 4th, when shortly after daybreak, the first scouting uh, patrol planes picked up the Japanese fleet about 230 miles off Midway. It seemed too good to be true. So they started launching right away. I put my two wing divisions uh, out on either side, and I headed straight for the nearest target, which was the Akagi. And the three of us unassisted hit the Akagi, whereas 10 of my planes, with 15 of the scouts and the group commander, something like 26 planes or so, all, all dropped on the Kaga. They caught fire and they never stopped burning. As I pulled out and started towards the uh, eastern periphery of the fleet, I found I was flying straight towards another carrier that was being torn apart by bombing. Despite all of their success, the Americans suffered a substantial loss of aircraft. Over 100 torpedo bombers were shot down. Armed with only a 21-inch torpedo, one forward firing and one rear-mounted machine gun, the antiquated plane proved extremely vulnerable to enemy attacks. were very limited. The fighters of the Japanese were clearly superior, but the uh, superior in speed and performance, but not in, not in uh, durability, whereas our dive bombers were the rear seat man fired what we call the flexible gun. It has 250 caliber guns that, that he fires that fire synchronized through the propellers, which means that you have to synchronize quite carefully so that you don't shoot your propeller off. As the bloody battle of Midway came to an end, all four Japanese carriers had been destroyed. This was the first clearly decisive victory for the United States. Such a substantial loss of carrier power, naval superiority. In the vast Pacific Ocean, the Americans and the Japanese needed more than land bases to launch aircraft. Basically, the aircraft carriers in the war in the Pacific were mobile airfields. Most of the islands weren't capable of taking large numbers of aircraft. And really, there was a large gap in the sea that needed to be filled by something. The aircraft carrier is an ideal tool for that. As the American carrier continued to prove its worth, putting more pressure on flight deck operation, factors such as pilot and crew fatigue, adverse weather conditions, and mechanical failure often prevented successful landings. Recognizing the need for larger, safer runways, the United States developed a more advanced carrier design. By the end of 1942, the new Essex carriers had longer and wider flight decks, more hangar space, and accommodations for as many as 90 aircraft. These carriers were fully complemented with anti-aircraft firepower fore and aft, including 20 five-inch guns. Months later, Britain and America developed another class of carrier, the smaller but slower escort carrier. Because their slower speeds make it more difficult for planes to launch, 
the Navy makes use of the hydraulic catapult. The plane was hitched to the catapult and pressure of the hydraulic fluid that was then released, driving the pulleys and the aircraft forward. During the Second World War, the United Kingdom in particular was being strangled by the use of German submarines against the merchant convoys crossing the Atlantic. The range of land-based aircraft at that time was limited. Escort carriers carrying only a limited number of aircraft, both for air defense and uh, as anti-submarine weapon systems, were probably a key feature in the Battle of the Atlantic in the battle against the German submarines, the German U-boats. Without them, the Battle of the Atlantic wouldn't have been winnable. The Japanese suffered their worst defeat of the war at the Battle of the Philippine Sea in what became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. 400 Japanese planes were shot down in one day. Japanese naval air power was almost completely decimated as they lost three additional carriers. The Japanese had resorted to using the kamikaze pilot. More than 2,500 Japanese pilots volunteered for a one-way mission to certain death in a desperate attempt to destroy the American carriers. In all, the U.S. lost a total of five carriers to Japanese bombs and kamikaze raids. The USS Franklin was one of the most spectacular casualties. The Japanese formally surrendered on the battleship USS Missouri on September 2, 1945. The war in the Pacific was predominantly an American war. There was a need for a large number of aircraft carriers to project the American naval power. America was the only country which had the industrial might, the number of shipyards available to actually build those carriers. So it was inevitable that America would become the predominant carrier nation. By the end of the war, America had deployed a massive carrier fleet. It was in the Pacific Theater in World War II that the aircraft carrier became the consummate weapon of the 20th century. But for the Navy, the big question immediately from the carriers, many considered jets too fast and dangerous for the carrier's flight decks. The jet age had arrived and adjustments had to be made in carrier design to support these powerful new planes. Naval shipyards went to work reinforcing the decks and arresting gear of the old carriers, this time in the waters off Korea. Both the United States Navy and the Royal Navy operated carriers during the Korean War. The major role of the against North Korea when most of the air bases in the south were under threat. Carrier planes often carried out successful ground attacks against enemy troops in the field in order to pave the way for American soldiers. While they did not engage in a contest for air superiority with the MiGs, uh, they did do a norm in interdiction bombing. Although the carriers continued to successfully complete their missions, it became apparent that technical innovations in ship design were badly needed. It was obvious that the need to operate aircraft uh, over a continuous basis to recover damaged aircraft on board the ship and basically to speed up the whole operation would a seal deck. An aircraft flew directly down the length of the axis of the deck and often if it uh, missed the arrestor wires which uh, strung across the deck then it would fly directly down the deck into aircraft parked at the other end. So in order to mitigate against that, steel barriers were put up, steel cables and ropes. But... Exhaustive research went into finding a solution to safe deck operations, and Britain came up with several significant developments. And I'd allow aircraft to land at an angle of two and a half, five, seven and a half degrees off the center line of the ship. It would allow aircraft to park at the bow of the ship and if the aircraft missed the arrestor wires as it was landing, it could just take off again and go around and do another circuit. It wasn't really put into proper use by the Royal Navy until the Americans had done so. The US Navy watched the angled deck experiments with some interest, and they actually produced the first aircraft carrier with an angled deck. Britain also developed the mirrored landing site. These enable the pilots 
to be able to land their aircraft in most weather conditions in chip rather than a batman he could watch himself coming into land against a natural reference point usually some lights new innovations had been made in landing but the jets also had problems taking off the pre-jet aircraft were lighter and had a greater wingspan enabling them to take off on their own power the jets needed additional help as aircraft became heavier and heavier, requiring more fuel, requiring heavier war loads to be carried, they needed something more than a hydraulic system to launch them from the deck. British engineers got together and developed a steam catapult jet aircraft. It's connected to the steam catapult by a series of steel bridles, which go to a runner in the deck. That runner in the deck is connected into basically a cylinder which is built into the flight deck. Steam pressure is built up, the pressure released, the dolly as it's called, travels down the flight deck, dragging the aircraft with it and flings it into the air. The first class of carrier designed to launch jet aircraft was the, the biggest carrier ever built. The flight deck measured over 1,000 feet in length. It had strengthened flight decks and larger deck lifts to take the aircraft from the deck into the hangar below. Its four five-bladed propellers could generate 200,000 horsepower, giving the vessel a top speed of 30 knots. Designers incorporated all the new innovations, steam catapults, angled deck, and better arrestor gear. Even though Britain's carriers had served successfully in the war, the Royal Navy found they could no longer afford to build massive carriers. They always had less money to spend. Right down the line, a lot of the major innovations that made a supercarrier work were developed by the British and then adopted by the, the U.S. Navy in much greater scale. The British introduced them, the Americans adopted them, and then built a ship that could really use that was the Forrestal supercarrier class. In the mid-1960s, the British government decided, for political and economic reasons, it could no longer develop the conventional aircraft carrier capable of taking fixed-wing jets and operating them at sea for long periods. So the Royal Navy developed a smaller, light support aircraft carrier, which came to be known as the Invincible class. Basic and helicopters. Their primary role is to defend a task group against air attack and to be used to carry large numbers of anti-submarine warfare helicopters in order to keep submarines away from valued targets. While Britain was cutting down on the size of her carriers, America was again making the development continue to progress naval aviators soon found themselves fighting another war, this time in Southeast Asia. From the very beginning of America's involvement in Vietnam, the aircraft carrier was an in which enabled strikes to be mounted against targets in North Vietnam like Hanoi and Haiphong, without having to use bases in the South, which were vulnerable to terrorist attack, and which in any case were already overcrowded with Air Force and Army aircraft. The uh, Navy pilots observed during the Vietnamese War, just as the Air Force pilots did, that the training in the previous years had been too concerned with safety. And if you're going to be very concerned about safety, you're not going to press the limits of the envelope. Uh, the Navy demanded of itself better training and created the Top Gun School. This new breed of highly trained aviator is much more capable than the pilots of just a few years ago. And a major innovation in the way in which carriers are fueled would completely revolutionize the present-day carrier. One of the biggest strides in carrier development came with the advent of the nuclear-powered carrier. Its size and capabilities are astounding. A total of 17 stories from superstructure to engine room. When the Americans developed a nuclear reactor that was economic and safe enough to go to sea, it was obvious that they would put it in their capital ships, the aircraft carriers. In 1961, the USS Enterprise became the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Propelled by eight atomic reactors, this alternative source of energy enables the ship to operate for 12 years without refueling. Nuclear propulsion made it a different ship because now you could operate this thing for 800,000 miles in the latest ships without having to refuel. It was over 10 years until another nuclear-powered carrier, 1974, 
the USS Nimitz became the second nuclear-propelled carrier. Unlike the Enterprise, this ship relied on only two atomic reactors. This reduction in reactor space subsequently provided badly needed storage space in the decks below. Below the flight deck of a modern aircraft carrier, there's vegetable shops to aircraft workshops, bakeries. It has facilities for sleeping, for eating. Gives it a flavor of being continental Europe. The rest of the aircraft carrier is designed to get from point A to point B and to keep those aircraft in the air, which means there's a great deal of area that is, uh, oh, put that aircraft carrier at sea and leave it at sea for six months. Everything that can be fixed on an aircraft and can go wrong with an aircraft is done on that aircraft carrier, from changing an engine to almost taking a wing off. The prime role of the modern aircraft carrier is to keep aircraft at sea for a prolonged period to enable air operations against other ships and submarines or against land targets. Every effort is made to keep this small city independent and mobile. Any replenishment the carrier may need is brought to it from the supply ship to members. The flight deck layout of a modern carrier is a direct reflection of operating procedures. There are four deck edge elevators, one on the port side, where it can bring aircraft to the pair of steam catapults in the rear of the ship. The others are on the forward and aft of the island on the starboard side. The positioning of aircraft in relation to the elevators is crucial because rapid flow of aircraft is essential when a large airstrike is launched. The carrier catapults are all at slightly different angles to allow multiple launches. The carrier can launch its entire complement of 90 aircraft in under 30 minutes. The flight deck crew is the vital key to this operation. The carrier flight deck is probably as close to a ballet choreographed industrial situation that you'll ever see. Each man on the carrier deck has to move in a certain way at a certain time or his life is at stake. And he has to do it while he's doing something important, arming bombs, uh, making sure that the airplane is properly inspected, uh, positioning it. Uh, it's a remarkable engineering accomplishment. The color of the shirt tells the function of the man. Yellow shirts direct all the airplanes on the flight deck. Nothing moves without their permission. White shirts inspect the aircraft as they approach the catapult for launch. Green shirts hook the planes up and perform all maintenance. Purple shirts fuel the aircraft. Blue shirts chalk and chain them. Red shirts handle ordnance. Silver suits are the firefighters. If an airplane crashes, their job is to rescue the crew. The brown shirts are the plane captains, responsible for the care of each airplane. They work long hours under arduous conditions, and although they are well trained, the work is inherently dangerous. On the flight deck, one mistake has the potential for lethal consequences. The extreme proximity of man and machine is a fundamental hazard. The planes are congested in close quarters in the flight and hangar deck. Every measure is taken to compact planes and other equipment when not in use. The planes have wings that fold up to reduce their size. When a plane lands, almost immediately it is taken and parked on the deck out of the way of flight deck operations. Built into the flight deck are four powerful steam catapults that induce acceleration more than five times the force of gravity. Within two and a half, three seconds, you go from zero to 150, 160 miles an hour, and it's just really a trip 60 feet off the water. There's nothing that can compare to it, absolutely nothing. It's a, an extraordinary thing to see them in operation and to see the uh, fantastic amounts of energy that are required to loft these big airplanes, uh, you know, 25, 30,000 pound airplanes uh, off the carrier deck from zero speed to flying speed and perhaps 120 feet. Putting 20 tons of airplane on a patch of rolling carrier deck can make even the most experienced pilot nervous. He never watches the deck. A 50 ton pull on the tail hook 
brings the airplane to a complete stop in two seconds. By the time you have realized that you're about to land an aircraft carrier, you're on the deck. It happens that fast. When the pilot lands, his plane is at full speed. He has only a split second to determine whether he has caught the wire or must continue at full throttle for another approach. From 10 miles out, the flight is directed from the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center. A night carrier landing, you're, you can't see anything. All you can see is the drop lights and the, and the deck of the aircraft carrier. Uh, it's extremely tense from the very first second you get in there, but it is the most exciting thing that you could, you could do. I, bar none anywhere is land aboard an aircraft carrier at night. Obviously, aircraft carriers like the Nimitz suggest themselves as major targets in time of conflict. That's why an aircraft carrier will never sail alone. It's always protected by air defense and anti-submarine ships. The standard battle group incorporates guided missile cruisers for Clephas and submarine threat, a guided missile destroyer, the outer defensive ring of the battle group, and nuclear attack submarines to sweep a clear sonar path ahead of the surface ships. At the heart of the group, the supercarrier against almost any threat. The F-14 is designed primarily to cover the fleet from an enemy intrusion by air. It's designed to carry six Phoenix missiles, the most expensive, the most sophisticated missiles in the world. The fire and forget missile, it can be locked on either from an E-2, which is the, uh, the Hawkeye, which is the eyes and ears of an aircraft carrier. The E-2C Hawkeye Airborne Early Warning Aircraft has an advanced radar that is capable of... The E-2C can track more than 250 targets simultaneously. The EA-6B was one of the most effective, if not the most effective, aircraft uh, during Desert Storm because it so effectively could it jam all frequency, all major frequency bands of the Iraqi and a uh, aircraft missile systems, which kept their head down and also allowed our aircraft to have their superiority. The A-6 Intruder is a two-seat medium attack aircraft with all... The Sea King anti-submarine helicopters use electronic sensors. They place sonar in the water for submarine detection. The F-18 is designed primarily as a attack aircraft, a light attack aircraft to lay down ordnance to take out enemy targets can also fire the Sparrow missile and the Sidewinder to paint it with its radar, and it follows that radar beam out. Um, the Sidewinder, of course, is the heat-seeking missile, which goes in on the uh, plume of heat coming up. The construction cost for these supercarriers can range into the millions and even billions. The question is often raised, can the United States justify this immense cost of building and maintaining these superstructures? In Desert Storm alone, the six carrier battle groups cost more than $28 million a month to operate. We're really talking about a major investment, but a major investment in a ship which probably will stay in service for at least 30 years. So certainly in that time, it would have paid for itself. In a world that shifted to concerns about wars within the third world, uh, an aircraft carrier becomes the best means of projecting yourself without intruding on the civil population. If you have an aircraft carrier parked 30 miles offshore, you have the same power and, and you're, you're not uh, intruding up, upon a nation. So I think we'll see aircraft carriers uh, in the indefinite future for, for power projection. Many military analysts consider the aircraft carrier a dinosaur, doomed to extinction because of its size, complexity, and cost. It might be the accountant's red pencil. However, no aircraft carrier has been destroyed in action since 1945, and they're still unrivaled in their ability to deliver massive firepower to the enemy's doorstep. 
If allowed, the carrier can continue to evolve. Technology has rescued the carrier before and may yet again. She's proven herself to be the most flexible type of warship yet devised by man.